fishing from the back. Dry fly fishing is one of the most exciting and interesting kinds of fly fishing because everything is visible. You can see the fish feed, you can see your fly, and you can see the fish take your fly. The sight of a big trout inhaling your dry fly is, for some people, the pinnacle of fly fishing for trout. Oh, you got him. <laughs> oh, wow. when you've been caught. Because this is the way you cast. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region where Huron and Superior meet. Dry fly fishing for trout is what many people imagine when they think of fly fishing. There's nothing that gets your heart racing like the sight of a big trout feeding on the surface, but conditions have to be right for dry fly fishing. In order to fish dry flies effectively, you have to have fish that are either feeding on the surface or at least looking up at the surface for food. Uh, the best time to fish dry flies is during a hatch when, when the fish are really concentrating on the surface, when they're emerging insects or insects falling into the water. Um, but you can fish dry flies almost any time. As long as the water temperature is above 50 degrees and the water is relatively clear and, and not super fast, you can catch fish on dry flies almost any time. Here are some of the times dry flies are most effective. When aquatic insects are hatching or changing from larvae into winged adults. When aquatic insects are returning to the water to lay their eggs. When terrestrial insects like ants, beetles, or grasshoppers fall into the water, especially on windy days. When the water is low and clear, especially later in the season when fish are in shallower water and notice food floating on the surface. Don't start casting the minute you see a fish rise. I know it's hard to resist, but you'll be less frustrated and have more fun if you hold off. When you spot rising fish, first observe and make a plan before you make a cast. Watch the fish rising for a while. Fish could be cruising in a slower pool instead of staying in one position. Or there may be more than one fish rising and a quick glance at the water may not betray that second fish. The worst thing you can do is throw your fly line on top of a fish. So make sure there is not a second fish rising between you and your target. Or make sure the fish you see rising is not moving. Okay, he's facing to the oh. right of that. <laughs> no, he's facing to the right of There's that. There's two fish. Oh, yeah. Got one nice, of them. Nice, nice, nice. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. That was awesome, man. Yeah, that was cool. If the fish spook, They'll typically just slide into deeper water and you won't see them again for quite a while. It's frustrating to find a good fish feeding and then spoil everything by scaring it. But by planning your first cast, you can make this most important cast count. Rise forms, or the way a trout moves water when it feeds on the surface, can tell you something about what a trout is eating. Often trout eat emerging insects just under the surface, which looks like a rise, but often just the back of the fish breaks the surface and not the mouth. This is often called a bulging fish and is usually not accompanied by any bubbles. A rise followed by distinct bubbles is a sure sign a trout took something off the surface. Generally, the bigger the rise, the bigger the insect the fish has taken. Very splashy rise forms are often made by smaller, more enthusiastic trout, and often the smaller the fish, the more commotion it makes. The rises that go unnoticed by many anglers are often the most important ones. Even a large trout can take an insect from the surface with very little commotion, just poking its snout above the surface and inhaling a fly by cavitation. Look for dark heads poking the surface film or little winks in the water 
These trout will often surprise you by their size. You can usually tell a big fish by the deeper sound it makes when it rises. Plus a larger fish moves more bubbles and foam aside when it rises. So it pays to spend some time observing fish feeding before you even make a cast or even pick a fly. A little observation can pay off in a most satisfying day. The next thing you've got to figure out is, well, what fly to use? What fly are those fish eating? And it's often important. Fish sometimes get selective. So you look on the water. Don't worry about what's flying in the air. There's caddisflies flying in the air here, but I don't know if the fish are eating those caddisflies. They might be eating something totally different. You have to think about what's on the water. You might not be able to see much. Sometimes a pair of binoculars might help you, but often you won't be able to see what they're taking. You may never figure out what they're taking. You may have to change flies a dozen times. I've had days when I never figured out what the fish were taking. So it's a lot of trial and error. You never know what fly they're going to take. You make some educated guesses. You go out there and you give them a try. Quite often when you have rising fish, there will be bugs over in the current lane where the fish are feeding and no insects where you're standing. And sometimes you actually have to try to wade over to the other side or where the fish is to get in the same current lane to see what kind of bugs they're seeing. So that's what I'm going to do here. We've got a fish feeding up there in the riffle. I'm going to carefully slide down here in the tail, pick up an insect, see what they're probably eating, and then come over and try to match it. So what I got here is a little PMD mayfly. Now he got a little bunged up when I caught him. He had just emerged and he's still a little soft. Uh, but that's okay because I can see the size and the color of the fly. So all I have to do is hopefully poke around in my fly box until I find a mayfly imitation that's about the same size and color. Most anglers worry too much about what fly pattern to choose. In any given situation, dozens of fly patterns will catch trout in the same pool. Presentation of the fly is just as important, if not more important, than the correct fly pattern. And next, we'll get some tips on how to present a dry fly. The great thing about dry fly fishing, at least when fish are rising, is that you know where a fish is feeding and that you often have an idea of what it's eating. There's the dry fly fish, yes, the challenge. The challenge has been met. A beautiful brown trout, yay. So what do you do when you're faced with some rising fish? what we all hope for. First thing you do is think about your position. Where can I get into the river where I can get a nice cast to the fish without spooking them and without putting my fly line over them? So you want to generally get a little bit over to the side or if they're not terribly spooky you want to get above the fish and throw a downstream cast to them. Once you've decided what fly pattern to try, planning your approach and presenting the fly in a lifelike manner is the next step. Once you've gotten a clue to what the fish are taking, pick the closest fly in your box to the natural. Apply either liquid or gel fly float into the fly before it gets wet. A trout will be watching the surface just upstream of the rise because as it comes to the surface, the current pushes it back slightly. So always cast just above the rise. It pays to take your time sneaking up on a fish. You never know exactly how close you can get and sometimes you blow it but the closer you can get, the more accurate cast you can make. It's a stalking game and that's what makes it so much fun. Once you've moved up a little bit, you may lose sight of where that fish was that you were going to target. So it's best to stop and wait for the fish to feed again so you know exactly where it is. Here you can see a fly cast directly to the rise, so the fly landed behind the fish and the fish didn't see the fly. Your first float over a fish should be your best. With every subsequent cast, you risk spooking the fish or it may see your fly drag. Carefully place the fly upstream of the fish so that it floats over the fish without drag. Drag is the most common reason a fish does not take your dry fly. And avoiding drag is even more important than having the perfect imitation. Slack line presentations like the reach cast, 
the parachute or tower cast, the S cast, or curve cast will be essential in all but the most uniform currents. Some days, dry fly fishing oh, is tough, it goes away and perfect. some days it's incredibly easy. <laughs> and when it all works out, there's nothing better. So what do you do if the fish doesn't take the fly in the first cast? When you have fish that are showing some interest in your surface flies, but they're not taking them, they're coming to the fly, they're, they're splashing at it, they're rolling on it, but not inhaling it, there are a couple things you can do. One is that you can put on a longer, finer tippet to try to avoid drag. Often it's just drag that's the problem. The other thing you can do, go to a one size smaller fly, or one of the best things is go to an emerger fly, something that floats just in or just below the surface. This trick of switching from a high floating fly to a lower floating emerger works wonders for many kinds of aquatic insects. Caddisflies, mayflies, and midges in particular. Emergers are harder to spot on the water, and if you have trouble seeing your emerger, Try putting a tiny strike indicator on your leader about five feet above the fly. Or try combining an emerger pattern with a higher visibility dry on a dry dropper arrangement. If you've made dozens of casts over a fish and it doesn't take, first ensure that the fish is still rising. You may have spooked it and it's time to find another fish. You know, it's often a question of strategy when you're dry fly fishing to fish like this. I'm waiting for these fish in here, hopefully, to come back up. I see some fish rising up above these guys, but if I wade up to the ones up above, I'm for sure gonna spook these guys. So do I stand here and wait for these guys to rise, or do I go up to the next one? Only you can answer that question. Don't be afraid to experiment with dry fly presentations. Every rising fish is a little different, and you may have to try several different techniques on a difficult riser, but that's what makes it all so much fun. When you've got fish that are occasionally rising and you know there's an area that's really stacked with fish, or if you're just prospecting for fish in faster water, a good thing to use is a dry dropper. And all you need to do is take a high floating dry fly, tie a piece of tippet on the bend of that dry fly, and tie a small nymph or a larger nymph if you've got a big high floating fly on the end. When you're fishing a dry dropper, particularly in slow water like this, that dry fly is not going to dive under. It's just going to hesitate. It might sink. But if that dry fly does anything weird, anything that doesn't look right, set the hook because it's not going to be a vicious strike. It's just going to kind of dip under. You can fish a high floating dry fly in combination with a smaller dry, with an emerger, or with a nymph. Whatever combination you choose, fishing dry droppers is a great way to fish on anything from big rivers to tiny brooks. There are certain casts that will definitely help your dry fly presentation. Besides the reach cast, the parachute cast, and other slack line casts, it's important to false cast properly and sometimes to throw curve casts. Let's get some casting advice that will be helpful in dry fly fishing from Pete Kutzer of the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer from the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today we're going to talk about false casting and adding more distance to your cast. An important part of casting, but an often overused part of casting, is false casting. False casting is periodically keeping that line up in the air when we're either drying a dry fly, changing direction, gauging distance, gauging accuracy, when we false cast, we're going to make that same pause like we do on our back cast, but then we're going to initiate that back cast after that forward cast. Just before that line straightens out, we're going to initiate that back cast, then we can deliver that fly back out to the water. We want to false cast, but not too much. Remember, the fish live in the water. So just think, just before that line starts to fall, we're going to make that back cast. Just before it begins to fall, again, start with that back cast. And remember, folks, don't false cast too much. Sometimes a situation arises where you got to get your fly to actually curl around something. Maybe you want your fly to crawl up the bank when you're stripping a streamer in, or sometimes there's a, a stump or a rock that you got to get that fly around. In that situation, we want to use a curve cast. And there's a couple different ways to throw a curve cast. One way is to make a very side angle cast 
where we take that rod and then we overpower it. If we overpower it, that'll create that side loop to come around and hook over to our left if we're a right-handed caster. If we underpower it, then we can get it to hook to the right. Another way you can throw a curve cast is by when you apply that acceleration to that stop, right as you're applying that stop, you make a twist with your wrist. That twist will cause that loop to turn, allowing your fly to then turn to the left. All right. Just because the fish aren't rising doesn't mean you can't catch them on a dry fly, particularly on a stretch of water like this where the water's low, clear, relatively shallow. We know there's trout in here, and there are some insects hatching. There's an occasional rise, but nothing that we can really target. But you can blind fish or prospect with a dry fly by poking a dry fly into the likely looking places, which is what we're gonna try now. So I've got a piece of water here, a nice riffle. I'm pretty sure there's fish in there. I'm just gonna fish this dry fly in all the likely looking places. I'm gonna concentrate on the foam line because that's where the food is and that's probably where the fish are going to be located. Fishing a dry fly like this, it's important to have a high floating fly or at least a fly that's visible. Something like a parachute with a white wing or something you can see because you don't have a rise to target so you've got to really keep your eye on the fly. That'll be better. Caddis fly did the trick. Yeah, uh, rainbow. I don't think he's done yet, but I guess he's done. <laughs> you, can, you can just lower than that and let him go. He doesn't need any reviving. Wow, that's a slab. <laughs> that's a, what you call a slab. We're here on the Gallatin River, just upstream of Big Sky, Montana. Beautiful, crystal clear stream that starts in Yellowstone Park. Uh, the water isn't too high, it's clear. I know a fish can see a dry fly, never fished here before, so I'm gonna start with a pair of dry flies. A stimulator, big stimulator to imitate maybe a stone fly or one of the grasshoppers there. And then an elk hair caddis to imitate the spruce moth, which is uh, been flying around and gets in the water quite a bit. So we'll poke around in this little pocket here and see what happens. What I'm doing here is just hitting all the little pockets that look good. A couple casts in each spot. I'm not going to waste a lot of time here. In front, of, in front of rocks is a good place, along the side of rocks, places where I can see the bottom deepens a little bit, and especially along the bank where the water slows. Fish in meadow streams like this often slide right up into the shallow water in the bank to feed, looking for grasshoppers, ants, beetles, things like that. Oh! The fish aren't really where I expected them to be today. The fish are all over in the shallower water instead of in the deep slot, which tells me there might be a bigger fish in the deep slot but not coming up for the dry fly. Oftentimes when you fish a new stream like this, it takes you a while to figure out where the fish are laying, so you have to really poke around and, and do a lot of prospecting with the fly. Pretty little rainbow trout. Also took the elk hair caddis. Thank you, buddy. I traveled to Alberta to join my friend Dave Jensen, who taught me a lot about small stream dry fly fishing. So Tom, what we got here today, uh, we're going to be walking up a tiny little spring creek. And right in front of us here we have a beaver dam that's backed that water up. So it's crystal clear water. Yeah. And 
what this beaver's done. It's real shallow here, but we're gonna get into kind of a trough as it goes all the way up. Mm -hmm. And on either side, there's a drop off right against the grasses that, that the trout will hold right tight to the grasses and come out, feed, and go back. Now, they'd be normally they'd be hard to see, mm -hmm. except in this crystal clear water, you can pretty much just walk along real slow, look at the base of the grasses, and walk up. We're looking for heads, pectoral fins, and tails. Okay. On some of the bigger males, they're gonna have that big flagging uh, tail, right. and that's a dead giveaway that he's there. Okay. Oh yeah. Oh yeah, baby. <laughs> nice fish. What have we got? 17, 18 inches, Tom? Oh boy. Oh, can't beat that. Well, I'll try in the middle of the day. <laughs> in the middle of a fairly bright day. There is nothing like a rise of a trout to your floating fly. It's what most people think of when they imagine fly fishing. Fly fishing for trout, it's one of the high points of fishing with a fly. More to fly fishing than just dry fly fishing for trout, it's one of the high points of fishing with a fly. <laughs> Whoa. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing. Don't forget, dry fly fishing, like any other kind of fishing, there are no magic bullets. Keep trying different flies in different presentations until you crack the code. And don't worry if you lose a fish. To learn more about dry fly fishing, visit orvis.com learn. This show has been brought to you by Orvis Rod and Tackle. Ontario, yours to discover. Ontario's Algoma region, where Huron and Superior meet.